about today. Uh, there will be a snapshot of um, a module which will be delivered as part of this uh, IPEN project, which is a, a European-Israeli collaboration on photonics <coughs> education in nanotechnology. And there's a module called Open Science. In um, blue background is the topics that will be outlined in my today's talk. And the full uh, package of the module will be available for you online. It is, under, it is under construction. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is about openness, why it matters, what is open science, and uh, how concretely, what does it mean, open access for scientific publications. As a, uh, on a general level, the module is about the approaches, tools, and common practices in open science. It is also raising awareness about similar terms. I'm, I'm very glad to, to have a question such as, well, op open what? Open what? All right? It, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to discuss about you know, similarities and differences between open notebooks, open data, open research software, and open access. Okay? There are overlaps, but not always, right? And as they can directly enrich each step of the open scholarly circle. And it's also an opportunity to situate research outputs, and by research outputs, I mean publications and data, right? in the context of a shared economy and the value of openness. What does it mean on a societal level beyond the, the immediate circle of the university? I don't know if you are familiar with that, but at that moment, at that very moment, there is a, um, um, a big initiative that is happening. It's a global initiative happening during this week, uh, which is called the Open Access Week. Uh, it's a very famous uh, initiative. It's, um, it's a worldwide initiative. <coughs> and um, the IPEN project is part of it, because this talk is, belongs to these um, attempts to connect between scholars, uh, communities at large, societal groups, uh, schools and non-educational uh, non educational partners to promote the importance of openness during uh, at different aspects of openness. And uh, as you see, there are many different types of events happening. We have workshops, presentations, seminar, discussion, uh, discussions and also happenings like uh, on, on, in the, on the road. Let me have, give you a snapshot of what is happening about open access. And this is uh, a tweet by QUT, which is Queensland University. This is Australia. Spark Community is, is, a, is a US uh, initiative. Uh, this, this is also editors like the Cambridge University Press. This is ANZ, means Australia and New Zealand. This is, uh, again, uh, Lancaster University over there. And uh, I have tweeted about, uh, you know, I've been also, this is also UK, a UK event. And again, Imperial College and many, many more. Uh, this is just um, a spontaneous uh, snapshot of what's happening and the importance of open access um, all around the world. Now, next to more mainstream events such as workshops, seminars, and so on, there are also more original uh, practices such as a course delivered through Twitter. And this is, has, has been delivered by the University of Catalonia, the Open University of Catalonia. This is the uh, UOC, um, upper left. So um, many things happening. But what it is, OK? Open access is great, but what is now open science? Let's have um, a look at, um, at a short video. Open access is free, immediate, online availability of research articles with full reuse rights. This is about, first of all, making all this content available for anyone, wherever they are in the world, to read and access and build upon so people can do interesting things and work in new ways with the material to really make the research literature much more valuable.
The history of the model is really publishing scientific manuscripts, especially ones with complex, detailed color figures, was expensive. And so if you wanted your article distributed broadly and widely, you, you know, sent it to one of these journals and then, you know, they would manage the review process and the communications with reviewers and revisions and eventually something would be accepted and they handled the typesetting and the printing and the distribution of your scientific work. And and, it, you know, it worked. It worked great. It, science progressed pretty well, and it became, you know, a, a good way to distribute scientific papers. And what's changed is, you know, really two things, in essence. First is digitization. You know, you can now do everything electronically instead of printing it. And the second is that the journals started ratcheting up the price of subscriptions to many of their journals. And so those two things came sort of to a head where it's become almost the theater of the absurd with the amount that some journals want libraries to pay to subscribe to the journal. Research has shown that journal prices have actually outpaced inflation by over 250 percent over the past 30 years. There are over 15 entire academic disciplines where the average price uh, for one journal is over $1,000 for one subscription for one year. Yeah, in chemistry, the average uh, title is $4,227, and physics, $3,649, and I mean, it even goes down into like agriculture is still over 1000 and geology and botany all over 1000 and those are just the averages. Those aren't like the, you know, way out there. So there's a, a journal called Tetrahedron that's $40,000. The journals aren't producing the material. The journals don't employ the people who write the papers. They don't even employ the people who review the papers. And it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of what science is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about discovering new things and spreading that knowledge around. It's so irrational to think that these scientists like me are paid by the government to do research and to discover things and distribute that. And then, you know, two years of work by 20 people is going to be compressed into a paper and then not made available to people. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so I think this problem of access to research is one that people run into all the time, but it's not one that they sort of realize. I know when I was a student, um, whenever I would be doing research and come across a great abstract and not have access to it, I just sort of moved on and thought, you know, well, this is the way it is. There's, you know, I didn't really realize that there was a system behind this, um, you know, that was causing me to not have access. And I think students' educations literally depend on access to the journal literature. I mean, professors can only teach what they have access to. If you look at less wealthy countries, like low and middle income countries, they really, really struggle um, to get access. And, you know, so that's a real impediment that prevents um, researchers in those countries from being able to you know, contribute fully or do world-class research. I mean, I was not, even with this lack of access and even with my brother starting the Public Library of Science, I wasn't convinced. I didn't understand why this was a big deal. And then we had a family medical emergency and I was up at three in the middle of the night in a hospital next to my wife in the hospital room surfing the web on the crappy hospital wireless internet and I was trying to find out information about a particular medical treatment, and I couldn't get access to the damn papers. And our doctors didn't know the answer to these particular questions, and we needed to decide about what to do with this medical treatment. And here I was, a trained scientist, with the ability to read and interpret and understand many of these papers, and I couldn't get them. And I just, that was the moment for me. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Here's the, what the problem comes down to in most cases. And because in the hospital room, I paid. I bought dozens of articles. The problem is that you don't know which article is relevant until after you pay for it. The abstracts don't always make it clear what is contained in the paper. So there was no return policy, right? I couldn't buy it and then say, this is wrong. I'm giving it back. So now are you going to spend $1,200 to just find out if possibly they're relevant? I mean, if you do that every day, you're in a big hole. It's not, I'm not, you know, a, some communist saying everything should be free and, you know, I don't believe in corporations. Nobody is saying that publishing is free. What people are saying is that we need to work on models where the government that is already paying for the research and is then paying for the subscriptions and is then paying for the indirect costs for the libraries 
I mean, in the end, taxpayers and the government are paying for this. So why can't we do it in a way where the knowledge is distributed broadly as opposed to the knowledge is restricted? So there are two components of open access. The first um, is that articles are available for free to read so that you don't hit that paywall when you click to read the full text. But the second part of the definition that's every bit as important is that the articles come with full reuse rights so that um, scientists and researchers can build you know, an entire new tier of tools on top of the research literature. And those new tools can interact with these articles, right? They can mine the articles. They can find relationships. Um, you know, they can find snippets of genetic code that are mentioned in multiple papers or different phrases or um, you know, concepts that are referenced in a biology paper and a chemistry paper. Um, you know, that, that individual researchers would never be able to uncover because they can't read this many articles. So if you actually wanted to do that, you couldn't because you'd have to negotiate individual rights with every single publisher in order to do that. In an open access world, all this information would be open on the internet for free and people would have unrestricted rights, you know, to do that kind of data mining. I think the main impediment is the incredibly slow movement of scientific cultural practices. I mean, I think, you know, scientists, despite being great explorers in terms of knowledge, are sort of very conservative in terms of changing their practices. Lots of the community says, oh yeah, I support openness, but I want a nature paper. That sort of reliance upon, you know, impact factor and the name of the journal does allow some journals to not respond to the community pressure towards openness. The scientific publishing model that we have now, there's no evidence that it is optimal. We need to experiment with all sorts of different scientific publishing systems. Corporations may figure that out before governments do. I'm very open to whoever is going to come up with creative solutions to these issues. I view it much more as scientists and scientific publishers are slow to change. Some of them are going to be left in the dirt because openness is clearly the future and the creative ones are going to, going to survive. It's really important that graduate students, you know, start these conversations with their research teams, their PIs, you know, just let them know that it's something that they care about. And, you know, there's a real benefit to researchers, to graduate students by doing this, right? Because the more people that see your work, the more people can build upon it and they'll set you. It's not just good for the person that can read your paper, it's also good for you. I believe that scientific knowledge spreads and increases best if there are no restrictions on access to the knowledge that has been generated in other places. I want the discovery of new scientific knowledge to happen faster, and openness helps accelerate that. Even if, for your own reasons, you need to publish in a subscription journal, there is this other option that even if you don't publish in an open access journal, that you can still make you know, the text of the article itself freely available so that people can at least read it and get access to it. I'm going to give you the European perspective. Uh, and there's a, there are two reasons for that. First, because I live in Europe. And the second is that this project is, is EU funded. Although it, it builds on an Israeli-European dimension, it is funded by the European Union, and somehow I'm, I'm, um, uh, I, I'm here to promote the European side of seeing uh, open access. Uh, in Europe, it's, it's a very hot uh, issue in, and uh, very up uh, in the agenda. To understand how, how important open access is, is that in, in very competitive um, funding schemes, such as the Horizon 2020, uh, funding scheme, uh, all scientific publications must be open access. So, uh, and you put your money at risk because the Commission can say you haven't put all your scientific publications uh, ac openly accessible and they, they may retain part of the grant. It's very important. So this is a must now. Some years ago, that was optional. You could still publish your publications from Horizon 2020 as a gold access, paywalled, right? But, but from now on, it is mandatory. And it's a big political change for us because it moves, there's a shift between a